All right. Technical issue solved, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. If not, I'll just wing it. All right, guys, hello. Um, my name is Gene Exter. I'm going to talk to you about something called uh, alternative uh, data. Let's see. Hmm? No? Yes? Alternative data on Wall Street. There we go. So um, before I start, before I start, I'd like to uh, say thank you to the organizers and the sponsors of this event uh, because I think without such events, the entire data ecosystem would not be growing at the rate it is today. So thank you so much, organizers. Let's give them a hand. Okay. So uh, Zainab mentioned monetizing data. And this is exactly what we're going to talk about right now, how to take data and make money out of it. <laughs> uh, you know, GPUs, CPUs, at the end, there's money, right? And uh, so I've actually spent about nine years in this world of alternative data, which uh, in a lot of industries would be just a rookie. I would be just a rookie. But in this industry, I'm considered a veteran, which tells you how new this industry is. So there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of learning, um, and, and let's first learn about what it is. So let's start with an, an investor. You are an investor. You're investing into, let's say, a hotel company. Um, you have data that comes from uh, things like Bloomberg, okay? And this data is available to everybody. This data, what am I talking about? It's stock prices, it's company earnings, it's all the regular stuff that, if you're familiar with uh, investing, it's all the stuff that you've and investors used for, for many, many years. So alternative data is really defined as everything, all the data sets that feed that investment process that is not standard, that does not come from Bloomberg, that is something different. It's a, a bit of a self-defeating definition because one day it is going to be the standard, but today it's not. So for now it's alternative, and we'll talk about maybe how that will change. Okay, so I think the best way to, uh, to talk about alternative data is to start with an example. Uh, let's pick on the lodging industry, hotels, as I mentioned. Now, how many of you have stayed in a hotel in the last six months? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Have you ever, in a hotel, have you ever wondered how many other people are staying in this hotel tonight? Well, investors wonder this all the time. If I'm an investor in a hotel, I really care about, I mean, I care about a lot of things, but I care about two things that, that more than all the other stuff. One of them is the vacancy rate. Okay, we'll figure this out. Uh, if, uh, yeah, that'd be great. You can, so I'll, I'll talk through this, but basically one of the things is the vacancy rate. The other thing is the room rate. And you put these two things together in a hotel, the vacancy rate and the room rate, and what do you have? You have the hotel's uh, revenues, how much money they make. So the vacancy rate, again, is how many rooms are empty uh, in a certain night, or a certain week, a month, a year, as a percentage of total rooms, okay? Now, the companies usually report this once a quarter, say, you know, this quarter across our, you know, 10 properties or 100 properties, our vacancy rate was 80%, right? Now, let me ask the audience this, think about this, and just raise your hand or shout out if you think you have an answer. What do you think is a smarter way, what could be a more insightful way to find out the vacancy of a hotel in a given night without having to rely on the company information. Like when you were at the hotel, how do you think you could get that percentage, how many rooms are full and how many rooms are empty, you know, and then in a new way? Any ideas? Yes. Parking lot. Excellent. Number of cars in the parking lot. Anybody else? Or there. Number of what? 
Number of keys hanging. Okay, how about this? How about this? Okay, good. How about this? The number of lights that are on at a certain between like, you know, 8 p.m. and 11 p.m., number of lights that are on outside, okay? Now, this is a perfect example of alternative data. In fact, I've been involved in a project, believe it or not, where we went around or a team went around and they stuck cameras across the street from a hotel, take a picture of the hotel every night, use an algorithm to count the number of lights that are on because, you know, maybe it's on for 10 minutes and maybe it's not and, you know, maybe it's a cleaner. But, you know, basically something that says, yeah, if, you know, count it, count it as yes if we see a certain amount of activity. And from that, uh, get vacancy rates, okay? That's one example. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the other part of the story is, like I mentioned earlier, the amount, the room rates, how much they're charging per room. Well, that one is really easy. You just go on their website, and you could check every single night how much the room costs. Now, you put these two things together. Every day you go to their website with, you know, either manually or obviously probably automatically. Uh, you get that information. You get the room vacancy rate information. And you can get some that I, I heard somebody mention. You could get that from the website too. Yes, sometimes you can figure out the vacancy rate from the prices and how they change. And... Uh, and so these two things together, they form a piece of information for a hotel investor, which would help the investor figure out how much money uh, the, the hotel is bringing in every day. And that information could be very valuable for investing into the company because you could know something before the rest of the street does, before they announce on their quarterly earnings. This is the type of data that is alternative data. Okay, Let me talk about some other examples of alternative data. Um, Online, uh, um, you know those toolbars you install in your browser? Well, most of you guys here probably don't install toolbars, <laughs> but a lot of people do install toolbars. Well, guess what? Those toolbars, of course, collect information. That information is sold to Wall Street. Uh, so online activity, uh, URL, click counts, um, satellite imagery data. Uh, somebody mentioned parking lots. So there are companies, uh, satellite uh, imagery companies that sell that data, and actually, um, that data, it, it, it's quite good. It's, it's quite a good party conversation, and sometimes it's powerful. But counting the number of cars in parking lots is, is actually uh, not the perfect way, not the best way to figure out how much revenue a company has made. But for some things, it's good for mall analysis and other stuff. Um, other examples of, uh, of alternative data, uh, any scrape data, any web harvested data would still be considered alternative data. So harvesting uh, eBay, harvesting Craigslist, um, how are we doing? Yes? No? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, some other examples of alternative data. Um, uh, uh, consumer, uh, consumer credit card transactions. That's an example of alternative data. Uh, 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 actually, obscure city records. So a lot of municipalities in the U.S. and, and across the world um, have very, very useful data, but it's very hard to aggregate, very hard to collect. Some companies collect that data, scan records, figure out uh, permit activity. For example, in the U.S., um, in every municipality, uh, every, every house, everything, every modification to, to a building, whether commercial or residential, has to have a permit, okay? These permits are collected across the U.S. Uh, at the municipality level. Now, uh, the U.S. is far behind other countries in terms of record keeping. A lot of times these are handwritten notes about some contractor that says, oh, we're going to do a roof replacement here. We're going to do, you know, a building, build, uh, you know, a, a AC, uh, air conditioning build out here. Anyway, these are all examples of uh, alternative data sets. Okay. That's good. That's right. It's better this way. Okay, so um, so now, uh, what is in this alternative data ecosystem? How How is it structured? Who are the players? Uh, I think of it in terms of three buckets. Bucket number one are the sources, the raw data sources. That's bucket number one. 
these are the people who actually own the data. Great. Thank you. Yes. So the supply chain. So you have the people who own the data. Then there are the intermediaries, people who maybe collect this data and analyze it and create an analytics layer on top of it. And there are the consumers of the data, and these are typically the funds, uh, hedge funds, mutual funds, uh, endowments, etc. These are the people actually using the data, any, in, in, any investor, people using this data to make better investment decisions. Okay, so in the first bucket, sort of the data sources, and I think you know part of the reason um, that this conference is a good fit with this uh, with this topic is because I think some interesting new providers of data are in this room today, and I'd love you know as you're looking at this presentation, if you think, hey, maybe I have some data that would be interesting to Wall Street investors, uh, talk to me afterwards. Uh, there's a uh, actually I'm doing a, a Q&A session at four, I think. We'll figure it out. So anyway, so what are the ways to collect this data? Direct data gathering. This is sort of like primary research uh, or web web harvesting. That would be all in this bucket. Okay. Data vendors. Uh, these are people. Usually, it's a company somewhere in the supply chain. And what makes this uh, what differentiates, uh, I would say, alternative data vendors from traditional data vendors is that alternative data vendors are not in the business of selling data. This is key. They are in some other business, but their data is exhaust. It's an exhaust of their operation, but it just happens to be very valuable in a way they probably never imagined. Okay? And then there's just downloading the data because actually, and this opportunity I think is sort of glossed over by uh, a lot of people because they think if I can just download it, it it's probably not valuable. Well, actually it is, uh, and that this is a, a growing data source that is, that is becoming quite powerful. Okay, so let's talk about direct data gathering. Uh, we have uh, web harvesting and primary research. Primary research is sort of surveys. Uh, that's, you know, that's old school, it's still relevant, but it's, uh, uh, it's a very developed industry. It's like Nielsen, IRI, NPD all these companies, and then web harvesting. Uh, web harvesting is interesting. Let me, let me see a show of hands. How many people here have ever worked on or ran a web scraper, a crawler? That's amazing. It's like 50, 60%. Okay, so if you've ever run a web scraper or a crawler, you probably might have some data that is valuable to a Wall Street firm. So when talking about uh, uh, this type of stuff, um, you know, web crawlers, I think, are the most uh, deceiving techno technical activity that one can engage in. Why? Because writing a simple web crawler is something that is almost like the second thing you do after a hello world. Okay? It's so simple. But maintaining a set of web crawlers that is consistent, that is accurate, that changes when the website changes, is extremely difficult. And so I usually advise my clients to not build their own web crawlers, to actually go out and buy or outsource their web crawling activity for various reasons. One, it's faster to scale. A lot of web crawlers have back data. Uh, if you start crawling today, obviously you're only gonna have data starting today. Um, it's, uh, um, and, and also there's a compliance aspect to this where a lot of the risk inherent in web scraping is actually undertaken by the by the party doing the scraping. So if you're a fund, if you're a client, and you're not too sure about this world, you haven't investigated all the laws, you know, you may actually get yourself into a world of trouble if you start, you know, pinging a website and you ignore a cease and desist, uh, and professionals may have a, a better, um, way better experience of dealing with it, and they're the ones that are going to have to answer if anybody comes and starts asking questions about, hey, why are you crawling my site? Um, you know, one of the advantages of doing it in-house is that you get control. And Wall Street firms love control. But overall, I advise to, uh, to outsource. Now, there are some new techniques for web crawling that I think are quite interesting. We'll just gloss over this. It just has to do with 
looking at the uh, expats and looking at the DOM tree and basically saying if the uh, if the end node of the DOM tree changed from one day to another because the website changed, can we get a new expat that we think maps to the same uh, node as before? Uh, and there are companies uh, and technologies that uh, these days do this kind of thing. Even though, um, in my experience working with a lot of web web crawling firms out there, few actually use this technology. Mostly, it still comes down to manually changing the XPath or the regular expression when a site changes, getting alerted in the middle of the night, oh, you know, your Craigslist scraper broke, you know, get up and change it. Uh, okay, so uh, primary research, um, I've mentioned this, um, you know, there are companies that have been doing this for years, but I think what's interesting, at least to me here, is when you start thinking about the world in terms of alternative data, in terms of, hey, where can I get this extra insight that, that nobody's thought of, you start really noticing these patterns that nobody uh, noticed before, and they're right there in front of you. For example, uh, receipt numbers, okay? Have you ever looked at your receipt and looked at the number? Well, for most companies, these numbers are sequential. So if you buy something at, at a store today, you come back, you buy it a month later, you look at the difference in the invoice number, well, those are the number of items that they sold that month. That data is quite valuable to investors, okay? Or you start looking at serial numbers. You know, maybe they're sequential as well. You know, you start looking at, you know, classified ads or Google Trends or, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, detail about the everyday world. I mean, there, there are all these stories about how the Allies used uh, serial numbers to guess how many tanks the Nazis produced. Um, where uh, the Walmart founder used to fly in his little plane to figure out where to put uh, new Walmart stores by seeing how many cars were in parking lots. Right? It's this kind of thinking that really uncovers this hidden world of data that could be monetized. All right, now this happens to be some of the most popular slides in these kinds of presentations. Uh, so if you're interested, get your phone out, and there's there's two of these. Um, so this is what I was talking about, the, the, the waste opportunity. There are tons of free data sets out there, and they're growing every day. Now, usually, there's, you know, I, I won't say much about it except for this. Um, typically, they're most valuable when enhancing a primary alternative data set. So let's say you have something like a consumer credit card transaction data. Well, maybe you can enhance it with one of these data sets uh, to add demographic or geo or you know, all kinds of other information. But actually, there are times that these data sets could be valuable all on their own. You can build a trading strategy just from these data sets alone. And there are companies, in fact, just yesterday, uh, my old employer, Steve Cohen, uh, funded a company uh, at $250 million that basically lets users build their own strategies on top of these data sets. So there's value there. And there's some more. You guys want to take a picture? I'm sure this will be available somewhere, but um, more data sets. Okay. <clears throat> High opportunity data sets. Um, let's, let's talk about low or, you know, the current landscape, and then we'll talk about high opportunity. Most alternative data focuses on sales, typically in the U.S. So consumer-related sales transactions in the U.S. Is it valuable to have a data set, another data set that focuses on consumer-related sales transactions in the U.S.? Yes, it is. But e every new data set is less and less valuable because, you know, uh, like Target. Target uh, in the U.S., if you look at how accurately the analysts have predicted Target's revenues, over the last eight to 12 quarters, the accuracy, the error, guess what the average error was at Target's revenues uh, that the sell side is predicting these days? It's 1% average, okay? So beating that is really difficult. And even if you beat it, nobody cares because the stock doesn't move on revenue surprises. That's Target stock doesn't move on revenue surprises. There are still, there's still revenue surprise U.S.-based consumer company data sets that are valuable, are going to be valuable. But where are the new opportunities? I put them into three uh, broad buckets. One, international data sets. While U.S. 
uh, revenues are mattering less and less for investors, international revenues are mattering more and more. Um, China online revenues matter a lot, JD.com, all these kinds of stuff. Uh, all these international data sets, I mean, there's a there's kind of, it's all very US focused. Even Europe has 10 times less alternative data coverage than the US. Uh, insights into margins. So just by the nature of these data sets, uh, most of them are going to focus on revenues, on sales. But if you can tell me something about the cost of these companies so I can get at their profit, that's really interesting, right? Tell me about their labor costs. How can you tell me about their labor costs? Well, maybe you can go on LinkedIn and scrape LinkedIn and look at their um, who they're hiring and these and try to run predictive models on these people's profiles to figure out how much they actually get paid. So you can tell me the labor costs as they change week to week. Okay, or maybe you can look at the uh, at the parking lot of these companies and figure out where the cars are coming from if you can have car tracking information. See the neighborhoods that the cars are coming from. Look at the average income in that neighborhood and say, well, if a lot of um, if more cars are coming to the parking lot of this company from higher income neighborhoods, that means they're probably spending more on labor costs, uh, you know, resource costs, all kinds of other costs, and then of course. B2B data sets, anything that has to do with B2B is extremely valuable all across the world. Why? Because most of these data sets focus on consumer related companies because you're tracking consumer related activities. Okay, how do we how do we evaluate a data set? You think you have a data set, you think it's valuable? Let's talk about how valuable it is. Um, one of the uh, one of the things we look for is scarcity. All right, is it, I mean, <laughs> self-explanatory. Uh, granularity, um, at the time level, right? Is your data set annual, is it quarterly? You know, is it monthly, is it daily? Basically anything that's, um, you know, we're looking for data sets that are daily, weekly, maybe monthly. Anything quarterly or an annual, um, it's going to be maybe an, an additive data set to a primary data set, something to enhance, something to to triangulate a primary data set off of, uh, but it's not going to derive value on, on its own. How structured is it? Actually, this is a very interesting question because on one hand, the more structured, the easier it is to get to the insights. On the other hand, the less structured, the more likely that if you get to the insight as a fund, you're the only one or one of the few that's going to have that insight. Uh, we also call that kind of valuable insight alpha. So um, you know, there is a balance. You want a data set that is just structured enough that you can do, you know, a couple of months of work and get the alpha and be quite confident that other funds don't get that same alpha. On the other hand, if a data set is extremely unstructured and it takes a year of R&D to get somewhere, well, you know, typically these funds are not that patient. And then coverage, of course. Coverage can be thought of uh, in terms of geography, but really from a hedge fund perspective, coverage is how many stocks it covers, how many sectors, and how many asset classes. Okay. Um, evaluating vendors. So if I am advising a fund, how do I help them think through what's a valuable vendor and what's not a valuable vendor? So, um, you know, basically you have these companies, again, that monetize their exhaust data, right? I, and I mean, we can go through a few more examples. Let's say you have a cardboard manufacturer. They manufacture cardboard, but their cardboard is used to package computers, Dell, HP, um, and you can figure out from their activities, you know, what the sales of these, of these, uh, of Dell, HP are, you know, what their sales are. Uh, you could maybe figure out um, from trucking activity, what the state of, what some macro indicators, um, ports, you can look at ports and you can sort of figure out, well, how many, how many goods are coming in and out of a certain country? You know, uh, when, uh, you know, in the U.S., if, if uh, you, you get a, a package or a, what do you call it, a crate uh, delivered to the U.S., everything inside is actually publicly available data. So every item that is inside that crate is available to mine. It's extremely noisy. And companies actually use uh, fake buyer names, like Walmart, it's not gonna be, they're not gonna say Walmart when they're buying stuff from 
uh, China and India, they're going to use another name. Okay, but you can try to figure it out. You can do machine learning to figure out who's who, and then figure out who's actually which uh, retailer is getting what product. Um, then you have uh, intermediaries. These are companies, you know, Tantan, M2, Seven Park, Eagle Alpha. These are all companies uh, that try to get these data sets and sell the insights. Because the fact is that this kind of activity is really, really expensive. Very few funds have the, uh, the money and the patience to invest the millions of dollars required to buy these data sets and R&D these data sets. And so for the smaller funds that don't have the appetite for this, you need, there's an there's entire market of um, an ecosystem of intermediaries that help them do this. Now, of course, the upside, uh, if you're buying from these intermediaries, is you don't have to buy these data sets yourself. You don't have to R&D them yourself. And of course, the downside is, well, you get the same thing that everybody else gets. Uh, you don't have your own unique uh, view on the markets. Um, but it's still very small. So, you know, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, I thought every fund is doing this. I mean, I thought this is how hedge funds work. No. Actually, very few funds are doing this. Um, maybe it's still, you know, 5% of the funds out there in terms of assets under management. The amount of assets under management using any of these methods is tiny. It's a sliver. It's a tiny sliver of the stuff. That's why that, you know, people worry about uh, alpha arbitrage of these data sets. Well, if I, if I have it and somebody else has it, isn't it less valuable now that I have it? In theory, yes, but because there's so little AUM riding on top of this data, it's going to take years before your activities in the market using these data sets is actually going to drive move the markets. You know, it depends really on the, on the stock. It, it, you know, the answer is it depends, but overall this is still a very, very small percentage of the overall population. Okay, so, you know, I'm sure as I was talking about of all this, a lot of you have been thinking, well, is this stuff legal? <laughs> you know, I mean, is this, this is ringing some bells. So the answer is, of course it is. But you have to be really careful and you have to be conscious of compliance. And so that's why we're going to talk about it a little bit today. Um, you know, in a way, these kind of strategies, you know, you look at SEC Steve Cohen, uh, when he built out the alternative data team after uh, he was dragged through mud by, you know, by the South District of New York, I mean, basically the the data team was an antidote to all the insider trading allegations that have been challenging his firm. Why is it an antidote? Well, because if you have a data stream and you can you can track you can basically uh, uh, track your insight your investment back to the data where it came from, and that data has been validated by compliance, you're in the green. Whereas if you have an investment that maybe was sourced by it through a conversation, well, who knows, right? That's a, that's a much more difficult thing to prove um, to uh, a judge and a jury. So from a technical perspective, um, the, the smart way of doing this is you have the data, from the vendors, the raw data or the aggregated data, and it comes in when it, it comes into this this box can be either a fund or it can be an intermediary. Anybody that's really using this data set is this box. It comes into a restricted environment, and this restricted environment is restricted in terms of access. So very few people have access to it. Okay, in in this environment, you do your PII scrubbing, and you basically do all of your make sure that it's. Uh, Make sure that the data is legit, that it doesn't contain any insights that are uh, that may set off some bells, and then you push it to your production to the rest of the organization. That's the simple version of it. Um, there, this is a huge gray area. There are very few laws in any country addressing this, but actually, what matters that I've seen personally through my experience is uh, intent. Intent matters. If you if you try in your organization to be above uh, water, it's going to matter. It's going to actually hold its own. That intent is going to hold its own, regardless whether it worked or not. Uh, that that you're trying to be compliant, uh, rather than, you know, just having the wild wild west and saying, well, there's no laws and regulations. Let's just shoot from the hip without best practices. Best practices matter, even if there is no master document, even if there is, there are no guidelines out there to tell you how to do it. 
you try, it's better than not trying. There are some frameworks out there, the NIC 100-122 tantalizing read. I highly suggest you guys go read it right after this conference. It's amazing. It's 11 p.m. Um, so one of the areas that really uh, sparks uh, the debate in terms of compliance is web harvesting. Can you go out, can you browse the web and crawl it and download the data from a website and is that legal? And the answer is, well, it depends. Um, overall, the, uh, the courts have ruled that as long as you're not misrepresenting yourself, as long as you're not clicking on, you know, I agree not to, you know, not to download anything or you have to log in. If you can just go into a site and maybe there's a terms and conditions somewhere below that you have to click on, that is not enforceable. Just because there is a link somewhere on the site for terms and conditions, that does not mean that you agree to the terms and conditions contract when you use the site. If you explicitly agreed, that's one thing. If it's just somewhere in the corner, uh, the courts have ruled that that does not constitute, con constitute a contract. Um, most of these, uh, most of the cases, let's look at the cases here. Most of these cases, uh, so this is a, a, an infographic of all the cases that have to do with web crawling uh, so far and over time. And if it's above this dotted line, that means it was uh, favorable for the web crawler. And if it was below, it was favorable for the website that was suing the crawler. Um, overall, uh, you can see that most companies are in the green. The ones that are in the red, mostly, they have ignored a cease and desist multiple times. So the advice is you should not ignore cease and desist. But other than that, tread lightly, follow best practices, but overall you can sort of collect information if you do it carefully with respect. Um, yeah, again, so, you know, stay ahead of laws and cases in terms of uh, all, all of these, uh, you know, anything coming down the pipeline. Uh, respect the terms of service if it's a click wrap. Let me talk about click wrap versus browser wrap. So a browser wrap is, uh, um, is, is basically where, you know, it's somewhere on the side. You don't have to click on it. It, it covers your whole browser. A click wrap is where you cannot use the website unless you click on I agree or you log in. Okay, these are very different. They should be handled very, thought of in very different terms. Uh, if you click on something, that could be a contract. If you did not click on anything, that is typically not a contract. Okay, so let's get to the good stuff. How do you actually make money? How do funds make money from these alternative data sets? The number one, the most common way is revenue surprise estimates. So we're trying to figure it. So you have a couple of components here. One is you have the revenues of a um, you know a company, let's say Target or let's say Lululemon. You have Wall Street analysts that cover this company and, and predict its revenues for the next quarter, the next year, et cetera. Okay, um, and the surprise is the difference between the first two. So whatever the company actually prints, whatever they report, uh, is going to be slightly different than whatever Wall Street predicted. Sometimes it's very different, and that surprise can be monetized. Uh, if the company has a positive surprise, that means they did better than expectations, the stock typically goes up. Negative surprise, the stock goes down. If you have a data set that tells you ahead of the tape sort of what is happening to the company, if you have an insight, if you have analysis, if you have primary research, you have secondary research, alternative data, uh, you can be better than the street because the street is not actually that it depends, but the street is typically not that great at predicting revenues, exceptionally, especially of companies whose revenues are not that stable. Um, so they are, uh, uh, so you can sort of see how that could make an investor money. Uh, operating gap measures, same stuff. So we're talking about um, income. Um, we're talking about uh, costs. We're talking about all this uh, stuff that the companies print that if you have an estimate before that before they release, you can potentially make some money. Non-gap measures. So what are these things? These are other operational metrics that are not covered by GAAP. Um, GAAP is an accounting standard. 
Uh, and uh, these are things like churn, for example, Netflix, subscriber growth, churn, flow share. Uh, you know, what's the, you know, what are people doing after they subscribe uh, on Netflix if they start also subscribing on Hulu? Do they, do they drop out? So knowing all these parameters will help a, a smart investor um, potentially make money. Um, fully uh, automated quant strategies. Uh, Non-equity asset classes. Most of this stuff is still um, equity. Most of this stuff still deals with equity. Some macro, but that's about it. You see very little of these alternative data strategies used for, let's say, any kind of credit-related securities like debt securities um, and strategic investment, thought leadership. So there, there are lots of ways that uh, investors could make money or monetize alternative data. But actually, the first one here, revenue surprise estimates, is probably about 90% of the game today. That's going to change. It's going to be 50% soon. But today, it's 90%. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I typically advise my clients on is that revenue surprise estimates uh, are valuable uh, sometimes uh, in, in generating P&L and actually making money off the security. But the real way to use alternative data is through thematic investments. And so what this is, is you create a debate between um, one view and another view, a long and a short, and you use alternative data to settle this debate. Let me give you an example. So one of the recent debates in the last year was around smartwatches. Okay? Um, are smartwatch sales going to impact luxury watch sales? Rolex, Omega, etc. So one side of the debate says, no, this is a completely different category. It's a, it's a piece of jewelry, all right? It, it doesn't, you know, this $500 watch or $800 smartwatch like a phone, you know, it, it's a, it doesn't affect people who go in to show off the status on their wrist. It's a totally different category, so they have nothing to do with each other. Another debate, another part of this debate says, you only have one wrist. So, of course, it's going to impact luxury watch sales. And the truth is that nobody really knows the answer. Okay? Uh, Apple doesn't know the answer. All right? Uh, Rolex doesn't know the answer. And this uh, store, Tourneau, Tourneau is a luxury watch retailer. They only sell luxury watches. They don't know the answer. The people that know the answer, the people that have all these different data components. All right? So, here's a type of analysis. Um, looking at two cohorts, one are Apple customers. Because if you buy an Apple Watch, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be an Apple customer. I don't think you can buy an Apple Watch without having some other Apple product. So you look at, look at Apple customers, non-Apple customers, and look at their sales at the store called Torno, which again, only sells luxury watches. And so you looked at their sales, um, these two cohorts, around the time that Apple announce the Apple Watch and all these different milestones. Apple announces, Apple pre-release, pre, uh, uh, pre and then actual sales. What you can see is uh, these are sort of year-over-year -year sales trends. The top one is you could see that when Apple started announcing or started like pre-order pre begins, the drop-off is huge, 30% year-over-year drop-off from these people. So this basically answers the question. Yes, absolutely. Luxury watch sales are going to be impacted by uh, smartwatches. And if you dig a little further, you can even figure out how much. You could know that every unit of a, lug of a smartwatch is going to impact luxury watch industry by X. Okay, So this is the kind of analysis that's very useful to investors. So uh, Movado, which is a luxury watch retailer, to to, it's a, a pure play name. That's basically all they do is luxury watches. They were really hard, hit by uh, by these news. But if you if you did this analysis at this time, you would have made a boatload of money because at that time nobody really knew the answer. You know, of course, luxury watch companies were saying, "No, we're not going to be impacted," and nobody really knew the answer except for people with alternative data. Okay, let's talk about the workflow and process a little bit. Um, so this is what a typical um, uh, uh, structure, the, the flow of a, a company looks like that's consuming alternative data. 
got all these different sources, third party, raw data, data vendors, and then inside you've got some different groups. You've got the data acquisition group. These are people that are you know, sort of going around the world, going to conferences and finding data sets, talking to potential vendors, talking or maybe you know, figuring out what websites to scrape or et cetera. These are people that are sourcing these data sets. Then they work very closely with the data analysts because to know what's a valuable data set, you must know um, how it's going to be used. And of course, they have to be, you know, you have to have a stack, a high performance stack, because these data sets, sometimes they're enormous, sometimes they're tiny. And what is the constant about them is that they're all very different. So sometimes they come as JSON files, sometimes CSV, sometimes a direct link to Redshift, sometimes, you know, just document. So you, you have to have a system that can deal with heterogeneous data sets. That is the key. Um, then this, you know, you have this R&D quant. This is a very interesting position where you try to create strategies on top of these alternative data sets. You may not be monetizing them because really to be successful at monetizing alternative data, you need two parts. You need these experts in the alternative data world, but you also need traditional investors who know how to make you know, how to integrate the insights from the alternative data process into the investment process. Because usually, alternative data insights by themselves are not tradable, typically, not always. This stuff goes to sector research and visualization teams, and then eventually it goes to long short teams and quant uh, traders. So these folks on the right hand side are the folks actually trading uh, the insights from alternative data sets. Um, you know, in terms of the conceptual process, uh, first you acquire the data sets, then you have to normalize the data sets, and this is sort of a overarching uh, category, but this, a lot of times, this is where the, the real, uh, you know, 90, 80% of your work is going to be spent in normalization and modeling. Because a lot of times these data sets do not represent the whole picture. They represent just a slice of the picture. And to know how to get from the slice to the whole pie, you have to, you have to model, you have to make some assumptions. This is, this is where these other data sets come in useful, these external data sets that I've talked about earlier, that maybe you can figure out, you know, you have maybe uh, online, uh, you know, online clickstream data from a million or five million users, and you can see their online shopping activities. But what we really want is their all of their shopping activity. Well, how do we get from their online shop activity to their total shopping activity? Well, you have to, you know, you have to model it. You have to figure out how this whole, all this stuff fits together. Sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes it's, you know, you have, let's say, data for the U U.S. data. You need to figure out international growth. You know, Netflix subscribers in the U.S. How does that relate to net Netflix subscribers worldwide? It may not. It may. You may need to combine different data sets. This stuff is so early that actually the combination of data sets is something that is very rarely done, almost never. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room are like, why? This doesn't make any sense. Why is this not done? But it is because it's very resource intensive, it's very new, and this is the state of the industry today. Um, and then, you know, eventually you get to gap operational metrics, modeling revenues, and then you get your quant signals, you get your thesis insights that I've just talked about. And then eventually it goes to, uh, you know, you have to metrics reporting, R&D portfolio, public figure. Um, I won't spend too much time here. I'm sure that uh, you guys could speak to this much better than I could. But this is a typical, this is very similar to the Berkeley stack. Um, this is your uh, typical um, investment research alternative data stack. Um, the elastic search is interesting there, you know, indexing documents. Um, but I'm sure this is going to be uh, very uh, familiar to all of you here. Okay, let's talk about, this is, I think we're coming to the end here. Let's talk about a, now I mentioned that, you know, quant strategies are typically not used on alternative data. It's too high dimensional, it's too difficult. Um, but with a few exceptions, um, sometimes we could actually make use of these data sets to generate money in an automated uh, string of systems. So let's talk about that. So let's say we have revenue surprise estimates for a bunch of companies. So we know, uh, we, we think we know what their revenues are going to be, and we can compare that to Wall Street estimates, and so we can figure out 
you know, what the surprise is going to be. Um, so you really need sort of three scores. You need to know what the surprise estimate is as a percentage of total, how, what the error is on our own surprise estimate, okay? And the third part is how sensitive is the stock going to be to a revenue surprise? So even if God Almighty came down from heaven and told you the revenues of the top 1,000 companies traded in the U.S., um, I'll tell you this, the correlation between the revenue surprise as a percentage of revenue and the amount the stock moves uh, a week around announcement time as a percentage of you know, a performance, that correlation is 0.19, okay? It's very low. So even if God Almighty told you the revenues of these companies, would you be able to make money? Yes, but it would be much less than you think because revenues are just part of the, part of the game. Uh, there are many other things that drive company performance. So you need to know, if given, for a given company, if we think there's going to be a surprise, how sensitive, how much is the market going to care about that surprise? And I can tell you this, the one insight here is looking at the, uh, looking at sell side notes, looking at the actual uh, written research about a company. If you just look for the word revenue or sales, if those words, revenue or sales, over time, bubble up towards the top of the document, not the number of occurrences, but how close to the top of the document those words are, that will tell you that this company will be more revenue surprise sensitive this quarter than it was last quarter. So let's say we have these three scores. Uh, we have the desired trading window. And so what we want is, what do we want? We want a company that, that is going to have a, a, a high revenue surprise so we, our estimate is very different than what the market, what the uh, sell side predicts. We want to be very sure of our estimate, and we want for the market to care. So we want our expected sensitivity to be high. And if we have all three of those things, whether it be high or low, positive or negative, we take our position. The size of the position is relative to these three scores, and the... Um, uh, you know, and the direction of the position is obviously the directionality of the surprise. Okay, and as an output, we uh, have our positions and quantiles. And I'll wrap up with this, that my prediction is in the next three to six years, this idea of using non-traditional data is going to be so prevalent that we'll have to figure out a new word from alternative. We'll have to change the world alternative. So it's sort of an arms race. It doesn't even matter anymore if these strategies make money on their own. Because just like no hedge fund would go into business without having a Bloomberg terminal, which by itself may not necessarily make you money, you know for a fact that if you don't have it, you're going to lose money. So just like any arms race, the participants have no choice but to partake. And over time, this is going to actually increase the transparency uh, of the markets. It's going to help investors really focus in on what matters, which is the underlying ground truth in the world around us. And because of that, I think this whole uh, idea of alternative data is actually bringing some, um, some refreshing changes to the world of investing because it's helping us focus not on what the other guy is doing, but on what's going on with the reality, which is ultimately what investors are paid for, for figuring out ahead of everybody else what's going on in reality and reporting it to the rest of the world using signal as they buy and sell the companies and help evaluate those assets they're helping the rest of us, they're helping the rest of society optimize the resource allocation, and now they're going to be doing it a lot more efficiently with alternative data. So that's it. Um, I don't know how much time we have for questions. Um, okay, great. So, for questions. Hi, Gene. Um, can you give us an example of um, uh, where um, alternative data has been used for non-equity classes? Because you said you see that growing too, 
fifty uh, percent, where it's hardly anything today. So, yeah, uh, an example and how why do you have that intuition that it's going to grow? Sure. So, um, I mean, you know, some non-equity classes act like equity, right? In a way, debt acts like a put option. And so, in that sense, if you have operational information about a company that's maybe close to going bankrupt. You want to know if they're going to be able to pay their creditors. In that sense, I mean, this is a, a, a cheap answer because I'm just saying, well, we're going to use it in the same way that equity is used. Here's the more interesting, uh, different way that these things are used. Um, if you are a venture capital fund and you'd like to get more information about the market that you're investing in, having alternative data will give you that confidence in your investment in the portfolio company. Uh, in, in, in a way, it's due diligence. It's market research. So for a PE fund or, or, a, uh, uh, or a venture capital fund, uh, these data sets can have insights that traditional data sets cannot. Uh, Ashutosh, yeah. you had a question? So uh, Dean, uh, I had a question regarding uh, what are your thoughts about the like, risk of insider trading using this data, using this approach? Right, so you know, insider trading is basically defined as when the insight that you have as an investor, you can trade without uh, having to do work on it, without having experience, without having, uh, um, having to basically put work. It's defined that way. If you have some piece of information where you have to put in a bunch of work to make a trading decision, um, then it's not insider information, typically. If it's some piece of information where you don't have to do any work, where an idiot can take that information and make an investment decision, that can border on insider information. These data sets are extremely expensive to analyze. They take a huge amount of work to go from, you know, here's your terabytes of data, tell me what companies to buy and sell. So it doesn't really fit that criteria. Um, in a way, it's an antidote. Alternative data sets are an antidote to insider trading. Most insider trading today is almost by definition things that people say to each other. It's not things that come from data sets. If it comes from a data set, it's not likely to be uh, insider trading. Now, of course, these issues, it's a gray area. And I guarantee you that in the next five years to 10 years, there is going to be a government government oversight over what's considered, you know, insider trading and what's not. But if you think about it, the very nature of capital markets is for uh, is for analysts to get paid for doing a huge amount of work to transform some pieces of information into a valuation and then give that information back to the market. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's working as it is supposed to. You have these difficult to find, difficult to analyze data sets. People are putting tons of effort into it. Very smart people, you have to have tons of education. And in the end, you are figuring out some nugget of information that nobody else can ever tell you. And you're putting that information back into the market. So countries, data for countries like China and India, right? So uh, if you were to stay for data, uh, crime data, for example, right? Uh, you would not get a lot of information, at least from uh, Southeast Asian countries, right? So uh, do you typically tend to uh, use uh, primary research for information like that? And uh, Right, so the question is information from, uh, from you know, non-US, non-Europe, rest of the world. Like I mentioned before, this is a uh, huge opportunity because um, because there simply is scarcity in the amount of data that's available uh, in in countries big big market countries India China uh, lots of you know Brazil um, these are big markets but very little data uh, so uh, you know in terms of what's currently used I mean there are some startups that are working on this uh, there are companies such as Nielsen and IRI that try to take uh, their methodology in internationally, but that's the whole point of me being here, is to try to um, 
grow this idea of alternative data uh, and try to find non-traditional data sets that could be additive to the investment process. And, and do you expect these startups to, to make this data available in, a, in an open source manner or, 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 or how would this data be? Typically taken? not because it wants to be, they want to monetize that data. Do we have questions in the balcony? Uh, okay. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, say, for example, I am I'm, I'm planning to open the e-commerce platform, a business on the consumer data, consumer products. So, how do I, I identify the alternative data vendors, or how do I get the alternative data? On how do you identify the current data vendors? Uh, yes particular to my business? Well, that's a challenge. Uh, the knowledge, the very knowledge of these data vendors is valuable. So there is really, there are very few places out there that uh, have a list of alternative data vendors. Uh, one place you can start is a company called Eagle Alpha. Uh, they are putting together a list of data sources. Um, you have to subscribe to their product to get that list. But they have a list of about 150 alternative data vendors um, that some of them are more or less valuable, but there is no easy way to find this data. Okay, uh, say for example, I'm I'm starting, I'm planning to open my firm in the local, uh, like regional, not international. At that, at that point of time, I need a data from the regional where I can, you know, yeah. sell my business. I mean, so data markets um, are one place, but these things typically haven't taken off, they're not, you know, I, I, Typically, the, the quality of data on data markets is still you know, low. Uh, there are some entrants, such as Quandle, um, that tries to buy data and resell it. So try Quandle.com. Thank you. Yeah, so new sentiment analysis, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, new sentiment analysis is, um, it is still an opportunity. Um, I think there are, you know, there are some companies like Raven Pack and others that, you know, try to get a sentiment out of, uh, out of news. Um, in my experience, for one reason or another, a lot of these new sentiment companies are using fairly standard algorithms to extract sentiment and they refuse to get more content, context, out of the news sources, so like directionality and you know, more sophisticated ways of analyzing. They're still sort of counting the scores on the words and adding them up, which these days has not that much value anymore. Um, so yes, there's opportunity. It's a very heavy investment, though, you know, I, you have to have 20, 30 million dollars to start a company to do good news analytics because it's very resource heavy. Uh, but yes, there is opportunity. Uh, hi, Jim. Uh, actually, partially your, my question was answered. Basically, like uh, if go out, I, I go to trading desk and, I, and tell them that there is something new, an alternative data. But right now, do you see any kind of standardization which is happening? Because from what I heard right from you, there are different vendors out there, so they have different strategies and like the way we take the logic example. So every sector is, you know, the, there is no consistency we see. And basically when it goes down to traders to, de to decide upon the investment yes. strategy like we have Moody and S&P, you know yeah. A++, so they understand it. I mean, uh, something we are going to, you see in future that uh, AD is going to standardize. Yeah, so there's no consistency, I agree with you. Um, there's no consistency because of the high dimensionality of these data sets. You know, this is not like, you, you know, even if you look at price data from exchanges, you have tons of feature engineering on top of just this one time series. Well, many time series, but one type of time series. Uh, here you have the very nature of these data sets is the dimensionality is exponentially greater than the traditional quant data sets. And the lack of standardization is not gonna go away. Um, in fact, it's part of the appeal. Um, as I mentioned, mostly it's fundamental funds, not quant funds that are using these data sets. The reason is because to interpret even the insights from these data sets requires the most powerful computer on earth, right here. Um, 
because of the high dimensionality. It's going to be a while until uh, quant funds, even though some are starting to do it, like you know, two sigma d sha, etc. But you know, it's going to be a while until it's it's going to be you know all standardized. A, one question. Um, for most of this uh, lecture was focused on like earning surprise. Uh, what would be alternate data that if you want to uh, predict mergers and acquisition or the success of a merger and acquisition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen data sets that try to predict that. Very interesting stuff. I remember a fund it was looking at uh, where the airplanes were flying, like private jets in the US looking at the tail number and seeing the destination of a particular CEO's airplane. So, you know, if, if, uh, if a carrier company is going to Kansas City or like some, some company that has to do with TMT is going to Kansas City, maybe they're going to be bought by Sprint. You know, so I've seen stuff like this done. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's uh, opportunity there and, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, there you do have to be very careful about being on the right side of the law. Um, but typically, again, if nobody's telling you which company, if you're not getting a data set that tells you this company is going to buy this company, if you, ha if you get something that you still have to put a lot of work, uh, you know, there's a lot of chance, um, then, then you're going to be OK. Uh, we just have time for one more question. Okay. Hi, Jane. Uh, this is more of a thought experiment in machine intelligence, but uh, less of a question. So currently, alternative data comes in when an analyst realizes that there might be, uh, you know, a more effective way of answering a question which is not available through the data sources that is available at hand. So, do you think that anytime soon we would have a machine autonomously deciding that it would need data from alternative sources, and being able to uh, automatically talk to another machine to get? No, data? I don't. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Why? Because actually the more valuable, data is valuable, okay? And so the more valuable it is, the more likely there's going to be walls built around these data sets rather than these data sets putting themselves out there and saying, okay, you know, use me if you want to uh, and, uh, you know, pay me if you think I make money. That's not going to happen. Uh, the more valuable data sets are going to be more exclusive. They're going to be available to a smaller contingent of uh, funds, um, it's still any fund that wants to buy them, right? But it, but um, they're going to be expensive. They're not going to put like a REST API out so any investor can utilize it. Um, that may happen in 20 years, but it's actually going to be be more isolated first before it becomes uh, you know more sort of um, democratized. People talk about democratization of data. I see it the other way around. More valuable data sets are becoming more exclusive. Yeah, which is where I had a follow-up question. So tomorrow, if like say in 20 years we have such a, uh, we, we have, we do reach the scenario in which, you know, such automation exists. Are there currently initiatives which are working on putting some kind of pricing or valuation to the exchange of data, which might happen? Yeah, at I that mean, level? Quandl. Again, Quandl is one of these places that, you know, if you have a data set, you can try to resell it, and uh, there's some, you know, market mechanisms around pricing. But basically, no, it's still, you know, that's, that's in the future. All right. Thank you, Gene. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah.